Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to the first session of day three of Virtual WolfCon. Uh, my name is Stephanie. I am here to uh, open up our day and our session. Uh, we are here with Laura Mandel, Lauren Lieb, and Brian Tarpley to talk about the Advanced Research Consortium. Before we get started, just a quick reminder that this is being recorded. Um, please feel free to use the chat box and please use the Q&A box for questions and answers. Um, at the, we'll go through uh, Q&A at the end of the session. And um, at that, I will pass it off to Laura. Welcome. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to share my screen and start my PowerPoint. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk about the Advanced Research Consortium, which I, for which I am director, and describe what the infrastructure is. Um, and the, the reason I hope will become clear that I wanted to be, that ARC needed to become involved with the Open Library Foundation <clears throat> as I do so. You can go to our website at ar-c.org um, the Advanced Research Consortium provides the social and technical infrastructure for these scholarly communities and websites, and they're listed here. I'll go through them individually. This is um, Medi the Medieval Electronic Scholarly Alliance. It's a community. It um, aggregates data and it peer reviews digital scholarship. That's the way all of these are. Uh, 18th Connect, um, Nines for 19th century electronic scholarship, ModNets for modernist scholarship. And we have a um, Studies in Radicalism Online, which is a, um, a way of, um, it, it's a, Michigan State University libraries, and they are trying to augment their special collections by bringing in um, resources that, um, you know, supplement their collection. They have a collection in radicalism, but they wanted people to come to a complete research environment on radicalism, and I will explain what that means. So the Advanced Research Consortium provides both the hosting of the community's interfaces, which are currently built in Colex, I'll explain more about that later, and the, the metadata that is ingested when any project is peer reviewed, when any digital scholarly project is peer reviewed, um, goes into our solar index, which serves all of those um, interfaces. We take in RDF. It is currently RDF uh, XML with, with local identifiers, but we are in the process of and have a grant to create um, external URIs and genuine linked open data. The ARC Solar Server uh, feeds the, it, it provides the catalog um, and a Lucene search engine and um, generates the data that is sent to the interfaces of all the various uh, nodes that we support. What this does, uh, the, each of these communities um, decides which projects they want to peer review that are digital, but they also decide what proprietary resources they need to make their research environment a complete one. And so you can see here is 18th Connect, and of course it's going to have um, the 18th century collections online, which is a proprietary resource. Our solar server allows searching proprietary and open access resources, resources at the same time. The proprietary resources have been acquired through contracts. And all we do is we create metadata for the, the objects in these digital um, resources that are proprietary that our particular communities wish to um, catalog. So for instance, nines will um, have a Victorian studies journal uh, that is in Project Muse or ProQuest or usually both. We negotiate with them. We don't pay them anything because all we're doing is providing a search interface for their materials. Anytime you arrive at a resource searching these communities online, you don't 
get the resource itself, you get a link to it. So it's just advertising for these companies and another alternative search method. So they're very willing to sign contracts with us. And um, we don't ingest their metadata, we ingest our metadata of their objects. The metadata itself is create, has a Creative Commons Zero license, just like um, the DLF. The metadata specifications are well documented at wiki.colex.org. And uh, we have um, created taxonomies. These taxonomies have grown. Every time a new community has started, they have needed new genres or new disciplines. I'll show you what that is in a moment. But as much as possible, we depend upon um, standards that already exist. So the only things that we don't depend on um, standards that already exist is uh, has Colex as a namespace. We have very stringent principles for metadata reform um, because it has in the past caught us, cost us quite a bit of money to um, re-catalog with new um, metadata standards. We've done it though, and um, both Brian and Lauren will be talking about the ease with which we will be able to do this in the future, which I'm very excited about. Because um, our metadata ca categories are designed for finding aids. They are, really are the way that literary and historical scholars who use these, who are members of these communities and use their search engines, how they think about the kind of met, um, objects that um, are ingested in our catalog. Nines was started actually in um, the first community, Nines, was started by Bethany Novisky and Jerome McGann at the University of Virginia. And we started meeting in 2003. I was on the, the Nines board. And the goal of it was um, to provide peer review for, for scholar, scholarly produced digital projects because Jerry McGann didn't want there to be a, a brain drain. We wanted pre-tenure scholars to be able to get credit for their digital work and not have to wait to do it until after tenure. Bethany Novisky, there, there, this, this history has caused um, some has is has is supporting our development in certain ways, and it's hampering our development in others. Bethany Novisky uh, created Colex with a programmer. She worked with a programmer called um, Eric Hatcher. I always want to call him Hacker, Eric Hacker, but it's Hatcher. And um, the result was actually Project Project Blacklight. So Colex and Blacklight were at one time the same thing. Uh, the problem came with um, Jerome McGann, who, who um, is wonderful and provided all kinds of money and um, you know, is a was a great supporter of Nines, but um, he was sort of a, a lone scholar um, who felt he was um, working against the world. He thought libraries would never be able to host some of the projects that we wanted to aggregate, that our communities wanted to aggregate, peer review and aggregate. So for instance, the Blake Archive. The Blake Archive has images from museums all over the world, the Huntington, the Fitzwilliam in Cambridge, the Tate, uh, the Pierpont Morgan, all over. And they were only able to get contracts um, for showing these images on the web and libraries couldn't get the same kinds of contracts. So Colex and Project Blacklight deviated much to our chagrin because we are stuck with this thing that has, you know, it's a branch of an open source project. It's not been kept up except by uh, companies that we hire. Um, we have all kinds of metadata ingestion support. Um, and these are the, this is sort of the, um, Oh, we provide contract negotiation support, I should say, with um, journals and other kinds of um, proprietary digital collections. Uh, you can search from any community, all the communities. Um, you can search, it's a faceted browser with a Lucene search engine running on um, solar. We're running solar. You can search only free culture items. Um, and we also have um, full text that is searchable. Uh, our solar server crawls the full text. We don't 
take in any projects. We don't publish them. We just link to their objects. And the solar server is able to um, uh, you know, run through those projects and um, allow full text search. Um, these are our metadata categories that we've developed. Format, however, is mostly DC type. But discipline is the discipline to which this object would be interesting. Um, and um, genre is, again, it's a grassroots um, genre system that has grown up based on the projects that wanted to be peer reviewed. We need agile metadata development so that we can revise and enhance these metadata categories as scholars start to develop other search terms. You can see the whole catalog at bigdiva.org. It's a visualization tool. Um, we show it on the big screen, but it is also um, a really wonderful to use on a laptop or a, even an iPad or um, a desktop computer. And you can read more about it at arc.org. Um, what this is, is the metadata from all of the art catalog grouped by resources, genres, disciplines, and formats. I'm not going to demo Big Diva for you, but I will say that just briefly that it has a time slider. And um, if you slide the time slider, go to the resources page, slide the time slider down to 1485, immediately prominent are all the medieval collections. Uh, the Parker Library from Stanford, um, the Walters Museum in Baltimore. And one of them is Roman de la Rose. That's immediately visible. It appears on page five of Google searches if students search for digital medieval manuscripts, whereas we make it front and center. So basically what you're seeing is a scholar curated uh, set of metadata that uh, aggregates and links out to all the items for which we have metadata. Um, that's just about Romanda La Rose appearing on page five of Google. And here it is, you can see prominently um, that the Rose is here with the Parker Library um, and the British Library and um, uh, Diam and a, a number of very important medieval resources. We're making it possible to email search results. That's not been implemented yet and to save searches. And you can see demos, you can get the code for Big Diva, but you can also see um, these two demo videos on the, on the small desktop screen and on the large screen. Um, and we are creating a linked open data version of Big Diva. This is in, con in connection with links. Um, Susan Brown, who's the director of the links project, spoke at the linked open data panel uh, yesterday. And so Big Diva will become a linked open data viewer. And um, that is our goal is to try to take all of the art catalog into linked open data. That requires transforming our taxonomy into an ontology or um, equating it with an ontology. Luckily, Lynx has hired a professional ontologist who will be guiding us through this process, who's working with Lauren, who is going to speak next. We have a few um, forthcoming scholarly communities. Um, uh, near, I forget what it stands for, it's the American Association um, of uh, it's the AAS, um, the American Association of Scholarly of Scholarship. Um, it's their catalog, basic, basically. And so this is early American resources, ah, networked early American resources. We have a community in dis digital disability studies coming and um, Quirk, the Canadian Writing Research Collaboratory is about to ingest their metadata. This is what networked early American resources looks like. This is what DigiDS the frame looks like in Colex. And um, the, this is Quirk's website. They will be contributing metadata. 
So we, because um, Jerry McGann had this idea kind of of going it alone and not working with libraries, who of course have worked out problems with images, um, with tr using triple IF servers and all kinds of things, uh, he didn't trust enough that, that librarians would engage with the internet, which is crazy, but it was 2003. Um, and um, so uh, Bethany Novisky had a lot of foresight and kept trying to pull us back into the library world. She is now Dean of Libraries at James Madison University in, at the, in, in Virginia. We've discovered that more than the people who research in these, um, in, in these communities, um, that really the interest among scholars is in creating their um, aggregations in curating their data sets. And so um, we are going to spend, as Lauren will, Lauren will describe and Brian, the next year trying to make it really easy um, for people to set up uh, in nodes and contribute to this metadata set. Um, I am, part, we are all participating, Susan Brown and I especially, in the OLF because we want to figure out how to get in, integrated into um, library systems uh, in a way that, um, you know, via open access means, or how can we share some of our tools um, with um, open access library platforms and services, um, things of that nature. And I would welcome any comments. I believe I've gone on too long. So I'm going to um, pass it now to Lauren Lieb, our project manager for ARCS. Hello, everyone. I'll just take a second to get my screen share going. All right, uh, so as Laura said, I'm Lauren Liba. I'm the project manager for ARC. Um, and today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about what that looks like and also the potential for ARC to grow. All right, so as Laura said, we have come a very long way since uh, Nines was founded in 2005 as the first project in what would eventually become ARC. And here you can see a timeline for sort of what those projects have looked like. Uh, all of this history uh, means that we have learned what kinds of structures are necessary for managing the resources from many different projects, each of which has its own particular goals and needs. Um, however, this long history also means we have a lot of legacy systems that are in need of updating. Today, I will be talking about all of the projects and the data that make up ARC. Um, and then I'll close by discussing our next steps in the future of the project. Okay, so ARC is quite large. Um, it has five active nodes, as Laura talked about, um, with several more in active development that will be joining us as official nodes, hopefully sometime in the next year or two. Uh, currently, we house over 300 federated projects across all of these nodes. Um, which makes for now probably closer to 3 million points of data. Uh, so we have a lot of information that we are covering um, and it is constantly expanding. For example, just within the last uh, couple of weeks, I've added the W.E. Du Bois papers collection in Ciro, uh, which added a thousand new artifacts to ARC's catalog. Um, and each one of these artifacts is backed by a wealth of metadata, which Laura described fairly in depth. Um, but I wanna highlight that the metadata standards are the same across all of the projects and nodes, which means that all of the data across this entire body of scholarship is really interoperable. Um, you can search sort of across the different nodes all at once. Um, variations between projects, of course, do complicate this somewhat, and I'm be happy to talk about sort of like the discrepancies between metadata with different projects in the Q&A. Um, but all of this metadata is right now submitted as RDF files formatted in XML. Um, but we do use the, uh, the pre-existing schema from Dublin Core and the Library of Congress for later terms. Uh, when each artifact is submitted to ARC, 
um, we ingest it into that database. Uh, and then we are in the process of translating that over into our new back end system, Corpora, which Brian will be discussing in depth in a little bit. Uh, in the future, we hope to simplify the entire process of this metadata ingestion by allowing project managers to input their data directly into Corpora, sort of skipping the XML step in between, um, either through uploading an RDF file that's currently existing or through using the more friendly graphical interface that Corpora offers. Um, and then Laura touched on this briefly, so I'll just sort of uh, briefly talk about this. Uh, we also have a customized set of taxonomies for disciplines, genres, and formats. Um, and these are tailored to the specific needs of digital humanities projects and the types of objects that they're most likely going to be working with. Uh, these taxonomies provide scaffolding for thinking about the works in question, um, both for the project developers and for later users. These taxonomies are really designed for the end user. They're meant to be um, very human searchable. They're meant to sort of mimic the way that we as humanists tend to think about these projects as we're working with them, as we're exploring them, as we're searching for them. Right now we are teamed up with the Lynx project um, and we are in the process of bringing all of this metadata uh, in line with linked open data principles. What that looks like in the initial stages is adding URIs to every individual entity and work that we aggregate within ARC um, and human vetting them because as I'm sure we all know, uh, when you try to create a script that goes out to VIAF or goes out to Wikidata to locate a particular entity or a particular work, um, we can only do so much. Uh, and our current system for searching these databases is very good, but it does occasionally have errors due to either the way the metadata is originally formatted, due to gaps in VIAF. Um, and then so the next stage of the project will be to go in and find what is missing and mint our own URIs for people, works, projects that do not currently have that data out somewhere in the web. All of this work means that ARC's projects are increasingly becoming interconnected, um, not just with one another, but with sort of this broader sphere of knowledge that the Linked Open Data Project offers us. All right, so I talked a little bit about sort of the history of ARC. And what this means is that right now, our front end for the user um, and the back end, but Brian will be discussing that in a minute, um, is a little bit outdated looking. This is what the current front end of nines looks like. And it's perfectly serviceable, but 15 years on, we can definitely do better. Um, the Colex infrastructure can be a little bit difficult for the ways that we uh, currently think about how best to navigate between different uh, projects and different um, connections between projects. It's based on a Ruby on Rails backend, which uh, again, a little bit outdated and we also don't have somebody actively on our staff who does that kind of work. Um, and then also right now it runs through a limited WordPress integration where parts of the front end talk to WordPress, um, but others require somebody to actually go into the database and manipulate the information. So it could be more user-friendly. That's what I'm going to spend the last part of my presentation discussing is where do we go next? What is the future of ARC? So within the next few years, we will be rebuilding both the user interface and the backend to make use of current technologies um, that also line up with the best practices for humanities scholarship. In this, our main goals are making the projects more accessible, um, making the interface more user-friendly for both scholars and project developers. So making all of this information easier to find, um, but also easier for 
people who are just getting their digital humanities projects off the ground to sort of integrate with. Um, and then also making all of this data more interoperable across the individual projects and nodes through um, the linked open data process. On the front end, this means that we're going to be having much more user-friendly, customizable WordPress instances, um, leveraging the new Gutenberg blocks. On the back end, Brian will be discussing our data management suite corpora. So the first steps for this, we will be redesigning mod nets and nines, so two of our nodes. Um, and this will be beginning in the fall of 2021. Um, over the next couple of years, we will be launching our new nodes, Muso, Music Scholarship Online, uh, Near, Quirk, and DigiDS, which Laura all talked about. Um, and then after we've gotten those up and running, we're going to be looking into de developing new period and theme specific nodes. Um, so trying to work with scholars in uh, fields that either are currently overlooked in ARC, places where we have gaps, um, or new and emerging uh, fields of scholarship so that we can help sort of aggregate all of that data as it is coming into being. I'm really excited to see where ARC is going in the next couple of years. Um, and I look forward to answering any questions you have about our plans or about our current metadata structures. All right, and with that, I am going to go ahead and pass things over to Brian. All right, thank you, Lauren. Um, I'm gonna start by pasting my uh, Google slide deck into the chat in case everybody, anyone wants to follow along. And let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Tarpley. I'm the lead software developer at the Center of Digital Humanities Research here at Texas A&M, as well as the Associate Director of Technology for the Advanced Research Consortium. Um, I'm here to talk about how we're using a tool called Corpora to ingest, wrangle, and improve ARC's large data set of bibliographic metadata, ultimately with the goal of replacing ARC's legacy infrastructure altogether. Um, Corpora is a web application that our center has created over the course of the past five years in order to serve the needs of a variety of DH projects. And thanks to recent grant funding from the uh, Linked Infrastructure for Network Cultural Scholarship or LINCS project that was mentioned earlier, uh, we'll be writing up robust documentation and properly open sourcing Corpora within the next year or so to make it more widely available. So we're excited to share it with you today as a kind of preview of coming attractions. Um, as Laura mentioned, ARC is an aggregator of metadata for scholarly digital artifacts. Um, in terms of organizational hierarchy, there is a central ARC office here at Texas A&M. Uh, but the reason we refer to ARC as a consortium is because it's comprised of various scholarly communities or nodes. Um, so far, ARC has aggregated metadata for roughly 2 million digital artifacts and counting. And at the ARC office, we receive this metadata curated by a project manager for one of the five nodes in the form of RDF XML files. Um, so while there are several reasons why we want to replace ARC's legacy infrastructure with Corpora, and I'll get to those shortly, uh, the most exigent reason has to do with our participation in the Lynx project. Um, ARC's chief role in the project is as a data contributor. And our broad goals are first to automatically ascribe an authoritative URI to each of the nearly 600,000 named entities in our catalog and human vet them when possible. Um, and the second goal is to convert all of those 2 million uh, bibliographic records into uh, linked open data triples that adhere to the links ontology and can be ingested into their triple store. Um, for reasons that will become clear, we could not rely on our current infrastructure to accomplish these goals, at least not in any kind of timely fashion. So to give you an idea about that infrastructure or current legacy infrastructure, um, 
As I said, all of our metadata lives in XML files. These files are stored in a Git repository associated with the archive they belong to. So we, for instance, uh, aggregate metadata from the Walters Museum. There is a Walters Git repository containing all these XML files with their metadata. Um, when we're ready to ingest metadata from an archive into our catalog, uh, we pull down that archives Git repo, feed those files into the arc indexer, which reads and parses the XML, and finally stores it in a solar index, um, which as Laura mentioned, allows us to search, sort, facet, et cetera. So while the current ARC infrastructure makes it easy to take all the metadata belonging to an archive and index it at once, um, it becomes frustratingly difficult to make a small change to a single record. Um, to do this, we have to find the Git repository belonging to that archive, clone it, search through all the files to locate the one containing our record, modify that XML directly, commit the change to the repo, and then fire off the indexing task again. Um, which is a lot of work just to change one record. Uh, similarly, uh, should we make a large structural change to our taxonomy of genres, types, disciplines, et cetera, changing those values in our metadata is a massive undertaking. Uh, we have to clone every repo, write a script to check every file for old values, change them to new values, commit, push, and re-index. Uh, this amounts to changing over 100 gigabytes of XML data. Uh, we also have to go into the source code of the ARC indexer, which was originally written in Java, and adjust the logic that tries to restrict values uh, according to our taxonomy. Our last attempt to make such a structural change was about five years ago, and it was such a hassle that we began planning a migration away from what we now refer to as our legacy ARC infrastructure. Uh, we've also found that while our solar index is fantastic at full text searching and faceting and aggregating our 2 million records, it becomes impossible to do other kinds of querying and analyzing. Um, <clears throat> we once attempted, for instance, to index the entirety of the ESTC with the goal of keeping track of not only uh, published books, but also their, their holdings across the libraries in the world. And while our metadata schema could describe this situation, um, our solar index fell, fell on its face when trying to query for records hierarchically. Uh, a single query ate something like 17 gigabytes of RAM and then finally timed out. Um, as Brian Geiger's efforts with the ESTC21 project eventually showed, it is certainly possible to modify the code base for the ARC catalog and the schema for the solar index to support hierarchical queries more efficiently. Um, nonetheless, we wanted an infrastructure that was a lot more flexible in terms of the kinds of questions we can ask of our data without having to make drastic changes to our code base every time we come up with a new question. Um, finally, our legacy infrastructure was mostly coded in Java and Ruby, and while there's nothing wrong with those languages, um, it means we have to either have staff members that are experts in those languages, uh, which we don't, or that we have to contract out any time we need to make a significant code change. Uh, for these reasons, we decided to migrate ARC to Corpora, but it was going to entail such a massive amount of work that we kept putting it off. Um, we finally found the impetus we needed thanks to the Lynx project. As I mentioned, Corpora is designed to serve the needs of a variety of DH projects. And in my experience, no two projects are alike in terms of what types of content need to be captured, analyzed, and displayed. Another way to put this is that each project is a little self-referential world unto itself with its own uniquely inflected ontology. So for instance, ARC needs to keep track of federations, types, entities, roles, agents, disciplines, genres, et cetera, and those things need to be able to reference each other in specific ways. Um, so we refer to Corpora as a data set studio. And the reason for this is that it has a built-in content type manager that allows you to create these arbitrary content types to build out your ontology of data according to the unique needs of your project. Um, a content type in Corpora is ultimately a set of fields. Um, that together form a schema for the object in question. So the schema for a named entity in ARC, for instance, is composed of a name, a type, uh, its external URI, whether it's been verified by a human being, whether it needs attention, 
Um, what are the notes, uh, of, you know, of the human better of the URI? Uh, what are the alternate names of this entity, et cetera? Um, when creating a field for a content type, um, you can select from various data types, which you can see listed there to the left. And many data types provide their own configuration options, such as the text, large text, and HTML types, which allow you to choose a period specific list of synonyms to, uh, for the search engine to use when querying the data stored in those fields. Um, as another example, the cross-reference data type allows you to designate a field as a reference to another piece of content stored in Corpora. Um, for every field, you can also choose whether the field should be indexed by the search engine, whether it should have a unique value, whether it should be multi-valued, et cetera. Uh, once you've built out your schema, it can be exported as a simple JSON file for use in other projects by just clicking the export button in Corpus Content Type Managers. Uh, schemas can also be imported using the same format. So I should also note that once your schema is built, you aren't locked into it once you've got data loaded into your content types. Um, you can add new content types, you can add fields to existing ones at any time. Um, allowing your metadata to evolve along with your project goals. Uh, once a content type has been defined, uh, users are able to create or edit a piece of content using a simple web form where the input controls correspond with the data type for each field. Um, some of those field types, such as the IIIF image URL field, uh, allow you to make use of special widgets such as this image viewer that makes uh, use of a uh, IIIF server's ability to serve tiled and zoomable images. Uh, and I think I actually have this example pulled up in our live instance of Corpora. So you can see here, um, this is a kind of uh, illustration metadata project. Um, you can kind of keep seeing the image tiled and be able to pan and zoom uh, as you need to in order to kind of fill out the metadata uh, for, for this image. Um, with large scale projects like ARC, of course, there are other ways of loading content, uh, which I'll speak about later. Um, once data has been loaded into the project, Corpora allows you to browse and search through your content by a content type. Um, here, for instance, I'm searching through our catalog of digital artifacts for items with the author Susan Brown. Um, this interface allows you to search across various fields and to perform various kinds of searches including exact search, fuzzy search, wildcard, uh, et cetera. And this interface also allows you to sort by any field and of course, page through your results. Um, upon clicking on one of those results, you're taken to that piece of contents unique URI, uh, which by default shows you an HTML representation of the data. Um, in order to fully support the kinds of analyses and visualizations that scholars in the humanities need to produce, however, um, simply browsing data in a tabular format is not enough. Um, when visiting a piece of contents HTML representation in Corpora, you can click on the Explore tab and see a network visualization of how that content is interconnected with other pieces of content. Um, and actually, I can just pull that up live, hopefully to... Uh, demonstrate that it is an interactive visualization. Um, and, you know, you can kind of see at a glance here that this artifact belongs to the Victbib uh, archive. It is a citation, it's federated with nines. And if you're curious about kind of any of these little uh, pieces of data, you can continue to sort of trace uh, out a line of fascination and sort of, uh, you know, and there, there are other things you can do with this, but, uh, you know, we're limited here with time. Um, let's see here. You can also explore the interconnections between items in your search results. Um, so uh, you can, for instance, select um, multiple agents, for instance. Here we've got a whole bunch of uh, agents or entities with the name Susan Brown. So if we wanted to explore and see kind of whether or not maybe those authors are maybe the same person and they need to be merged together. Uh, we can kind of quickly visualize uh, these interconnections and sort of make that call. Um, all right. Uh, 
by and large, DH projects are about examining existing cultural artifacts. And while it would be nice to live in a world where the data for every project comes in a nice neat set of Excel spreadsheets, uh, the reality is that um, scholars come to us with a wide variety of digital data in disparate formats, whether it be a set of PDFs they want to OCR and annotate, a hard drive full of images they want to create metadata for, a database full of bibliographic metadata stored as MARC records, or as in the case with ARC, a collection of over 300 Git repositories containing RDF XML files. Um, while Corpora allows users to upload those source files into their corpus, um, there's simply no one size fits all approach to then extract that data and save the results as instances of Corpora content types. For this reason, most large scale projects like ARC require that data be ingested programmatically. Um, in order to make the development of that code convenient for developers like myself, Corpora comes with a built in coding environment in the form of an IPython notebook that allows you to create and test your code one step at a time using um, Python, which has become a kind of lingua franca for academic coding, particularly in the sciences, but increasingly in the humanities as well. Um, one of the things that makes Corpora unique as a platform is that the back end is written entirely in Python. Um, once code has been developed inside that uh, environment, it can be easily converted into a task that any authorized user can run on your corpus. Um, this screenshot, for instance, uh, shows the form you fill out in order to launch the ARC indexing task. Um, Corpora's task queue is asynchronous and parallelized, which means you can queue up thousands of jobs at once and you can effortlessly kind of scale Corpora up to run as many task consumers as you need. Um, aside from allowing you to define your project schema and load the data in according to that schema, Corpora provides several means for you to then present that data to the public. Um, the first of which is a simple out of the box API that spits out a JSON representation of your content. Um, beyond merely allowing you to get to your data as JSON, uh, Corpora's out of the box API allows you to search, sort, aggregate, and explore the connections between your data. Um, you just manipulate the parameters of your API requests and you can perform um, all kinds of different searches on any particular field in your schema. Um, you can also provide the URI for a piece of content and see all the other content that either references it or is referenced by that content. Um, indeed, the front end for Corpora completely relies on JavaScript calls to these API endpoints um, to present the data. Ultimately, what makes the API so flexible in terms of how you can query your data is that every piece of content in Corpora lives in three types of database at once. Um, while technically any one of these databases or even a rela relational database like MySQL um, could provide much of this functionality on its own, um, by leaning on MongoDB for quick document retrieval, Elasticsearch for searching, sorting, and aggregating, and Neo4j for exploring the interconnectedness of data, uh, Corpora is able to effortlessly scale in terms of the size of your data set without sacrificing performance. Um, in truth, the secret sauce of Corpora is precisely this sort of multi-model um, kind of database uh, strategy. Um, another ingredient to the secret sauce of Corpora is the fact that it's built using Django. Um, this allows the code base for Corpora to be inherently extensible. Um, all these special tasks like indexing ARC archives and performing URI attribution uh, live inside a plugin folder that can be easily added to a given deployment without directly modifying the Corpora code base. Um, and speaking of the extensibility of Django, um, one of the more popular features is the ability to leverage Jinja2 templating when outputting data. So what you see here is the content type template editor, uh, which allows you to create any number of templates for representing a particular content type. Um, so in terms of presenting data to the public, you can create templates for rendering custom HTML, XML, JSON, or in this case, uh, turtle statements that generate on the fly representations of your content, uh, depending on your presentation needs. 
So here is a, a snippet of the same piece of content being represented up top using uh, RDF XML. Um, and here in the bottom, uh, the turtle format appropriate for ingestion into the links uh, triple store. Either of those representations can be accessed by visiting the artifacts unique URI and just including the name of the template at the end of the URL. Um, a shout out here to Aaron Canning, the Lynx ontologist who did all the heavy lifting to create the turtle representation of ARC's metadata. Um, as a final note, uh, I wanted to mention that while we're fortunate enough here at Coder to have a rack of servers at our disposal to ho host Corpora at scale, um, Corpora's entire stack, including the three databases, the web app, the Nginx web server that orchestrates them, uh, all of that lives inside of Docker containers. And as such, um, I do the majority of my development and testing with Corpora running on my laptop. Um, so regardless of the kinds of computing resources a uh, researcher has at their disposal, whether a single Windows desktop or a MacBook Air, um, Corpora can run on it, allowing them to build, improve, and wrangle their data sets uh, without needing a sophisticated server infrastructure. Um, okay, that's all for now. Thank you so much. And I figure we'll be opening things up for questions. Thank you it's so much, um, Brian and Lauren and Laura. Um, our question queue uh, is empty at the moment. So I'll start things off by asking um, if folks are interested in keeping up with what ARC uh, is doing, what's the best way to um, follow along with your work? I, I can answer that. Um, Great. That's a really good question. Uh, right now, um, we have just been able to hire uh, Lauren as a project manager. So um, we um, were able to, thanks to the Lynx grant, you know, um, I, one of our biggest problems, of course, for ARC is sustainability. Um, and I was able to bring it to Texas A&M as a signature project for my center. So it's center supported, but we don't have staff that we can devote to it at the center, except for Brian's programming time. Um, for the last five years, we haven't had a project manager. And so Lauren has just started. And um, the best way I believe to um, follow what we're doing is through the ARC website. Uh, the new, I think there is a news tab and uh, Lauren has lots of plans for building that out. At the moment, it's a little bit sparse, <laughs> but um, Lauren is just taking over now and um, we'll be able to um, fill that out um, with uh, you know, uh, all of the steps. I mean, the, the best news item we have um, currently is becoming a member of OLF. <laughs> and that was a notice that went out in your newsletter. So, um, or is going out, I'm not sure which, um, but we will be, um, of course, begin with that, begin with broadcasting that. And I will say that the foundation is very excited to have you all. So thank you for joining us. Okay, um, we've got a couple questions coming in. Uh, this one's for Brian. Do you know if Corpora had an earlier search tool than Elasticsearch? If yes, was there a hard transition away from the old search? Um, that's a great question. So, um, the yeah, so both Solar and Elasticsearch are ultimately um, Lucene search engines. Um, so there was kind of an earlier um, iteration of Corpora that was built and you know entirely using like a MySQL database, and you know we leveraged as much as we could the kind of searching um, that was part of that. But ultimately, um, you know, at scale, um, trying to use MySQL to do searching um, across a whole bunch of fields and, and whatever is uh, ultimately not, um, I mean, unless you just go in and really index every field according to how you're going to search, it's not flexible enough. Um, so uh, thankfully, I was able to sort of um, you know, uh, just lean on the large community out there for Lucene um, and kind of uh, transition toward just relying on Elasticsearch for all of our searches. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Thank you. 
All right, our next question. Are there any issues for joining US items to the links with the Canadians? Uh, their work looked interesting in yesterday's presentation. Yes, thank you so much. So um, the uh, links project is of course funded by the Canadian Foundation for Innovation. And it's an infrastructure project and it relies on Compute Canada, which is their basically um, huge server farm for researchers in universities across Canada. So of course the emphasis will be on Canadian content, but they want the links data store to reflect international content, um, everything uh, available historically. Um, we in ARC will have Canadian literature ingested via the Canadian Writing Research Collaboratory. But then we also have all these records from the um, you know, English short title catalog that Brian was talking about um, and Lauren and um, Echo and Ebo and all of these things um, that you know, Canadian researchers want to be able to access. So thank you, that's a good question, but there's no issue actually. Oh, that's so great to hear. It's also exciting to hear um, people uh, making connections between presentations from one day to the next. Yes. Um. <laughs> Brown is on our executive board um, and at ARC, as well as um, director of the Lynx project. Um, and so um, we have benefited tremendously from that collaboration. Oh, that's so great. Okay, so next question. How many US colleges or universities participate in ARC? Yes, well, <laughs> you know, at the moment, uh, all of our communities and all and Big Diva and everything is just available online. It's completely open access. Um, the question is how to get library catalogs aware of what we do. Um, so, um, we've started thinking about this process in a couple ways. Uh, one is to figure out whether we can help projects be ingested by their home universities. We saw at the LOD that UVic has a repository for digital scholarship. Most, I, I don't think many university libraries have that other than their um, you know, uh, places for storing things for faculty. I forget what those are called. Um, but um, at any rate, um, you know, for archiving things. So our goal has been one of the, the values of these communities is because we do peer review of digital scholarship, we insist upon standards. You know, if you you if you've created a text, which most of it is, it's mostly historical and literary texts. Um, if you created a website with textual data on it, is the textual data encoded in TEI? If not, why not? Um, so we are able to get people to try to use the standards that are out there um, for scholarship. That what that means is um, with the uh, one of our own um, coder projects, um, the Digital Done Variorum, which has been won prizes from the Modern Language Association, um, what we've started to do is to try to um, create TEI that can be ingested into their um, DAM, which is Fedora 4, um, so that when we create a library record for a project, um, you know, the website for the digital done will eventually disappear. I mean, let's say be optimistic and say 50 years um, that it's upgraded to for 50 years, but who knows? it'll eventually disappear. We don't want to give libraries anything that will eventually disappear. So um, they ingest the actual TEI encoding. We'd like to make it viewable alongside the images via a IIIF viewer like Mirador. Um, and you know, in that way, create a permanent asset that a library catalog can reference as well as the current interface. Uh, then ingest the metadata and ideally ingest it in um, our library uses EBSCO, uh, you know, in the whole EBSCO system or the whole um, system so that it's available to other university libraries as well. Uh, to, to state this a little less, um, you know, I'm uh, at sea in the details to try to state the bigger picture. Uh, we'd like to get the um, the scholarly digital projects that we peer review ingested in library university library catalogs in some way we haven't worked out how um, and the other thing we would like to be able to do eventually is when those records 
are in our library. So here, you know, the University of um, Te Texas A&M University Libraries has many of the original images of the John Dunn Variorum, digital Variorum, that they are putting on a IIIF server. It's not there yet. Uh, we have them on a IIIF server temporarily. Um, so we would like to, um, you know, be able to have a, a library catalog record that refers to the images and the text stored by the library that are library assets, but also an external URL. And then maybe just off the, to the side, more like this in Big Diva, right? Where people can go and do a graphical search. Um, that, that is the goal and the dream. I have no idea how to implement that. My first goal is to learn more about the library world, which I'm grateful to OLF for being so patient with me in um, helping me um, become educated. Uh, you know, but again, Jerry McGann diverged from collaborating with university libraries, which was a big mistake. And we're trying to find a pathway back. Well, it certainly sounds like uh, there are a lot of exciting things that could be happening with ARC uh, coming down the line. And um, for those uh, joining us in the audience today, if you're interested in joining ARC, I think this is a pretty clear call for um, action on Laura's part. So thank you. Okay. Um, has the ARC been successful for luring humanities scholars into the digital realm? Absolutely. Um, we have um, held workshops uh, when we were flush with money, melon money. Um, we held workshops every summer. Um, we um, held some at my university, some at the University of Virginia. Um, we uh, were able to offer um, fellowships to go to the Digital Humanities Summer Institute, which is the primary organ for, for scholars to learn how to do, um, you know, um, standards-based digitization. Um, and we work with them. We work with these uh, people all the time. So we say to them, if you want to be peer reviewed, we have all kinds of documentation. I just showed you the tip of the iceberg, um, all kinds of readings they can do. But we say, if you want to be peer reviewed, you know, please contact contact us early so we can help with your data model and your, you know, your coding scheme and all of those things. So I just consulted with something called a project called forthcoming NEH funded Jane Austen's desk. And I will be a consultant on it. And it's all the objects in Jane Austen's house and community. And of course, we're going to, they're going to be images and um, photos and, you know, telling them how to um, create the proper metadata for those images and the proper presentational format so that they can easily, you know, so that when the, when the project comes through peer review at nines, um, the technical side is a check. You know, they, they've done everything. And now we're just looking at the content. And, you know, people have pa failed peer review based on content. They don't fail permanently. We say you don't have enough Swinburne here to call this a Swinburne site, you know? <laughs> and so they go get more Swinburne, you know, um, and things like that. But um, we really are trying to work in, in, in really deeply with scholars to help them uh, bring them into the digital world. And we've been very successful with that. Oh, that's great. Um, you mentioned peer review. Have you um, had any success stories with scholars getting tenure? Now, that's a real question. Um, we've had most of the success stories that I can call to mind are people getting grants. Um, if they say they've been peer reviewed, you know, the prototype and the prototype data has been peer reviewed by Nines or 18th Connect, um, and I can write a letter saying it will certainly be accepted when it's done, and this is what it's going to um, look like metadata wise, um, they do get grants. Um, the reason I'm having a little trouble thinking about this is um, I, as a as one of the first generation of digital humanities professors, and now being a full professor, I do peer review all the time for scholars with digital projects, both for tenure and for promotion to anything up to full. Um, I sometimes do seven of them a year. <laughs> so if I have something like what we do at, um, at 18th Connect is if a project passes peer review, the director writes a letter the Occam uh, project at Dartmouth, I wrote a letter that got them an NEH grant, but it also says, you know, you should submit for the MLA bibliography prize. Um, here's what the reviewers said. Um, the reviewing board is as, as illustrious as Cambridge University Press. 
you know, and then we say in there, this is the equivalent of a book, or this is the equivalent of two articles. And it's, you know, it's false in a certain sense, but it's the way we are trying to um, sort of bridge traditional peer review criteria with the new digital environment. That's great. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one last quick question. I think this will be headed towards Brian. Um, can Corpora be reused by other institutions and is the source code available as open? Yeah, that is absolutely our goal. Um, and, you know, uh, happy if anyone wants to uh, message me to send you a, a link to our kind of repository. Um, the reason why I'm not just like publicly sharing everything about it right now is because it still needs to be uh, robustly documented and we need to figure out, you know, licensing and the whole deal. Um, it will be 100% open source. Anybody can use it, download it, you know, personally on their laptop or use it at an institution um, and all of that. Uh, thankfully, we have sort of funding for this coming year to, to get that kind of work done. So. Um, I'm hoping, you know, sometime next year, maybe early, uh, we will definitely be publicizing about Corpra and, and really be excited about people kind of using it in their own environments. Um, so thank you for that. Great. Question. Thank you. We'll uh, make sure to keep an eye on your newsroom then. All right, uh, we are at time. Thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. Thank you to Laura and Brian and Lauren. This was an excellent conversation. And our next session is at 1040 Eastern for a folio overview. So I will see everybody then. Thank you again. Thank you.